Brilliant. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk you through our framework for how we assess uh, climate alignment of oil and gas companies, and um, particularly in reference to their emissions targets. I'll talk you through the framework that we've outlined in our most recent report, which is an extension of work that we've now been undertaking for a number of years. And then I'll short, uh, talk through the assessment of individual companies with a focus on Equinor, and then also present a relative ranking between different companies as well within the industry. But first, I think it's really important just to really highlight that Paris alignment requires planning for production declines from oil and gas. There's really no way around this. And on the screen is a whole range of different scenarios from the International Energy Agency and, and others, um, which I suspect will be familiar to many of you, many of you but I will talk through those. Um, the chart itself is showing oil demand uh, in million barrels a day over the next 30 years out to 2050. And looking at the top, you have the International Agency Energy Agency, sorry, states scenarios, their stated policy scenario, 2.5 degrees C, and that's business as usual. But even that scenario is basically flat production out to 2050. Yet, of course, that takes us well beyond Paris goals. Those other scenarios highlighted, which are 1.5 to 1.7 degree outcome scenarios, all show production peaking this decade and then falling rapidly through the 2030s and into the 2040s. So if you're a company, an oil and gas company, and you're not planning on your oil, particularly your oil, but also your gas production too, to be planning over the next couple of decades, ultimately, it's very hard to see how you can be considered Paris aligned. Managing this peak will be challenging. Shorter term higher pricing does lead to a risk of, uh, particularly right now, and particularly in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, does lead to a risk of overinvestment in new projects that simply will not be needed as the world moves away from oil and gas. And timeframes are critical here. If, if companies are investing into new assets right now with the hope and expectation of higher pricing, as we move through over the next five, eight years and prices fall away as uh, uh, demand uh, weakens, ultimately, uh, this will be a huge uh, problem and we're potentially left with assets that are not needed um, but are ultimately locking us into further emissions into the atmosphere. So at Carbon Tracker, we have five key metrics to assess climate alignment and transition risk. The first is looking at companies' production plans. Ultimately, are companies planning for declines in production, as we've just talked about? Two, how are companies allocating their capital? Are new developments and investments into new oil and gas production projects, but of course other midstream and downstream projects too, are those compatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we use our carbon trackers least cost modeling uh, in a most recent report, Paris Maligned, uh, where we look at that. Three, and subject of the, the, the bulk of today's, today's talk is, is on emissions targets. Ultimately, are they framed appropriately? Because if they're not framed appropriately, then whatever that target is and, and whatever the actual number of the emissions, if that target is not framed appropriately, the, the company is not pursuing the right strategy to reduce its emissions. And we have our hallmarks of uh, Paris aligned emissions targets. Fourth, it's, we think it's really important uh, to ensure that executives are appropriately remunerated and incentivized. So if the board is not incentivizing the CEOs to deliver the appropriate strategy, then ultimately they will do what uh, delivers them the most personal benefit. So individuals re re respond to incentives. So we think remuneration is critical. And then finally, I flag some work some of my colleagues do on climate risk disclosure. Is there adequate reporting um, of, of climate risk and transition risk within the accounts? And are auditors also performing their role when they sign off that the company accounts do incorporate climate and transition risk appropriately? For example, how is, what is a, uh, what do companies' cash flows look like, assuming lower long-term pricing, which is would be the result from a lower demand or lower consumption, which is necessary uh, under a Paris aligned scenario? So that was a whistle-stop tour through what we see as some of the key metrics uh, to assess climate alignment and transition risk for oil and gas producers. So moving swiftly on um, to looking at emissions targets in more focus. Ultimately, we see that emissions targets offer an insight into mass management attitudes towards a decarbonized future. They signal the pace and credibility of emissions reduction strategies of companies. Um, and for investors, they enable the selection of companies for climate-related products, and they also help compliance uh, uh, and 
understanding reputational risks. Clearly, for policymakers and civil society more broadly, it enables uh, an analysis of emissions targets, enables that, those audiences and other key stakeholders to assess whether companies' claims and how they're acting on, on climate, ultimately, whether those claims stack up or perhaps uh, there are uh, further inconsistencies uh, and there are further questions, sorry, that should be asked of those companies themselves. So first, uh, sorry, many, em many emissions targets have fundamental flaws. The first of these is we see that they emit scope three emissions. And as in the simple graphic there, scope three emissions generally account for 80, 85 to 90 percent of the total life cycle emissions of oil and gas. So that's including the operational extraction emissions, the processing, the transport, and the end com use combustion, uh, for example, in an automobile. So that um, in, in full life cycle and that scope three, that end use combustion is 85 to 95 percent of the problem. So emissions targets that do not include scope three emissions are just looking at a very small part of the problem. Our view is that if a business is activities inherently rely on these emissions. So if you're an oil and gas company selling, uh, producing crude oil, refining it and selling it for consumers to use in the combustion, uh, sorry, for consumers to use uh, in vehicles, ultimately that business model is reliant on those emissions being released. And therefore we believe that scope through emissions should be included in company targets. Second, generally they often lack scope one, two, and three net zero goals. They may be net zero, but only on scope one or two, or even just on scope one. So for us, we think it's critical that there is a net zero goal. And to reach um, the goals of the Paris Agreement, we need to get to net zero in around 2050, so mid-century. But of course, how we get to net zero matters. And I'll show you here two conceptual pathways, that red, which is a slow emissions and ultimately production decline, and a green, which is a faster transition. Both reach net zero in 2050, but each of those pathways will have a greater, um, uh, will have a difference, sorry, in terms of the temperature output in 2100. So it's critical that emissions targets have interim goals so that companies cannot have delayed action potentially all the way out to 2049 and then suddenly reduce their emissions. It's critical that we have emissions interim targets, for example, in 2030 to ensure that there is adequate action on emissions in the short and medium term. It is not just a long term uh, problem. Fourth, we see that many emissions targets from companies, they exclude non-operated assets. So the, com the assets that com many, some companies have targets which cover the emissions from the assets they operate themselves, but exclude the assets emitted where they have an equity stake in another company's operations. This is particularly the case, for example, in joint venture operations, again, in particularly and a particular relevance thinking about joint ventures with national oil companies, for example, um, for in, in North Africa and Middle East would be one example there. And then finally, some companies uh, consider emissions across all of the uh, the products they make, in, including their refined products, but they do not include the emissions that result from the purchase of third party crude. So with the refined fluids that they've purchased from somebody else, often those operational emissions in the, of, of the initial production are then excluded. So that's a final, final piece uh, of sort of final fifth element we see uh, of fundamental flaws in existing targets. So our hallmarks of Paris aligned emissions targets, hallmark one, they must be, uh, targets should include scope three emissions. Hallmark two, they should include scope one, two, and three uh, net zero goals with interim absolute reductions on the pathway. And then scope uh, hallmark three, they should be on a full equity share basis and include the third party crude. So if we now look at the 25 of the largest uh, oil and gas producers globally that are in our universe, and we look and assess those companies across each of those hallmarks. We find that just one company is potentially Paris aligned in that it meets each of those hallmarks. But of course, even that one company, any, it, despite it meeting all of those hallmarks, it may, it still needs to have uh, a plan to reduce emissions that is credible and is at a pace which is consistent with Paris. For those other 24 companies, we see that there are fundamental flaws in the way their emissions targets are framed, and therefore we just see that they do not lead through and link through to the finite limits of the global carbon budget.
And just a, a word of which, which targets we're assessing. For each of these companies, what we do is we take uh, their emissions targets, and, and in some cases, companies have multiple targets. And in, in the case of Equinor, there are at least four separate climate targets. And we then select of those targets the, the target which most fulfills each of our hallmarks. So these companies may have other targets, but they actually they would have even less green on this chart in terms of um, fulfilling each of those hallmarks. So if I just highlight Equinor specifically, we see that they, they do have a target which covers scope uh, three emissions, and it is net zero, does reach net zero by 2050 on scopes one and two, but it does not have interim absolute reductions because it is ultimately is an intensity based target rather than an absolute target. Uh, and as I say, this is the target of Equinor that, that most fulfills the, 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 um, our hallmarks. And there are other targets which, which uh, have an even lesser link through to, to the budget. So having looked at the, the companies uh, individually in this table is currently ranked alphabetically, what we can do is move through to compare how the companies stack up against each other. And that's what we have in this next table. Um, we find, particularly versus our previous work, actually there's been little movement in the relative rankings between our companies. There is an, a clear Atlantic divide, so that the European companies generally appear more progressive in our relative rankings than, than, than North American companies. Uh, and in our expanded universe this year, we do find that, that the national oil companies that we've added uh, appear at the bottom part of that, that table. Um, so that, that's the likes of CNOC, PetroChina uh, and Saudi Aramco as well. But what we have in this table is a relative ranking. And, and in our report, Absolute Impact 2023, we have a, a decision tree about how we derive this. But fundamentally, it is linked through to those same hallmarks. Um, and we divide the companies into four tiers. There are those that 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 meet hallmarks one and two and, and either fully meet or partially meet hallmark three, shown in the blue. And we see those companies the most progressive uh, companies in our universe. And they, they include any Total Energies, Repsol and BP. In the yellow, we have a middle tier where, where we, for companies, uh, sorry, yellow and orange, we have companies that fulfill scope um, three emissions, uh, sorry, include scope three emissions. Um, for Shell, Equinor and Oxy, they, they include a net zero target, but they crucially are only intensity based uh, approach to emissions reduction. And then finally, in the red at the bottom, we have those companies that do not even set a, a credible scope three target. So looking at Equinor's position, we see Equinor sits alongside Shell and, and Occidental Petroleum in the US in that middle tier. And we see them as certainly lagging behind um, other European companies. So any Total, Repsol and BP that we see is the, the relative, uh, the relative leaders. So um, ultimately, the approaches to emissions reduction must be credible. So what we have outlined there is this target that the companies are aiming for, but how they reduce emissions must also be credible. So even any who is that leader in our table, um, for, for its targets to actually be considered Paris aligned, we see that their approach to emissions reduction should not rely on duly on asset sales, the deployment of carbon capture, utilization and or storage technologies or nature based solutions to in some way offset what is frankly a relatively uh, easy to abate sector of oil and gas production for, for ground transportation um, compared to where CCS should be reserved for some of the hardest debate sectors. And then finally, the purchase of third party carbon offsets. So for company targets approach to emissions reductions, companies must adopt a credible approach as well. So to conclude, companies must, in our view, set targets that fill each of our hallmarks of Paris aligned emissions targets to link through to the finite limits of the carbon budget and also must set credible plans to reduce emissions. I hope that uh, is a, a very quick summary of our of our most recent report, um, Absolute Impact 2023. Um, and please do reach out to us directly if there are any follow up questions and we'd be happy to to talk through with you in more detail. Thank you for your time.